DLAT uh, to identify off-grid energy technologies, products, and distribution strategies that can have significant social impact on a large scale. He has a background in material science and received his PhD in polymer science and technology from MIT. Uh, prior to D-Lab, Eric worked on developing materials for solar cells and waste remediation systems for the oil and gas industry. So join me in thanking him for coming to talk to us tonight. Thank you guys for having me here. I really, uh, I really appreciate the, the work you guys do organizing topics around this area. Um, for particularly, uh, there's a particular overlap with D-Lab, uh, where we do international development work. So I want to start by just giving a bit of context of where the work I do uh, sits within D-Lab. So D-Lab's mission is to, uh, to take on tackling poverty uh, through innovation, mainly through the development of appropriate technology uh, and sustainable solutions uh, uh, for international development. And so the mission statement is to cultivate a global network of innovators uh, that create and disseminate technologies to end poverty. So that sounds really broad and has a lot of big words in it um, that, that can mean a lot of things. Uh, and DMAP does a lot of different, uh, a lot of, uh, approaches this in a lot of different ways. There's work in education, field work, and research. And within that, um, there's the academic offerings that a lot of people are, interest, uh, are familiar with D-Lab in. There's uh, 12 to 18 courses, about 12 every year, some that rotate. Uh, there's field work, and there's research. So where we sit uh, at scale-ups, it's here in the middle, between field work and research in the scale-ups program. Uh, some other things are there's the International Development Innovation Network. This is a network of innovators, uh, 450 innovators around the world that come together for summits and share technologies. Uh, the research is done by masters and PhD students, there's Europe's, there's study abroad trips that cross them between field work and academic offerings. You can see there's a big, a big mix of things and, and most people do have work in more than one of these areas and cross over and sometimes we get confused on exactly what we're doing. Um, but trying to integrate all these different things together, uh, these different approaches is, is part of the goal. So within the scale-ups program here where I work and uh, there, there's several areas as, as well. So the fellowship program, this is a, a fellowship that, that, uh, for social entrepreneurs working in international development. It's a one-year fellowship. Uh, there's a technical assistance program where looking to uh, it, it give uh, technical assistance to small and medium enterprises uh, to disseminate these type of technologies. And the area where I work is the industrial outreach program. This leverages big business to bring technologies to scale. So kind of attacking from different sides of uh, entities, you know, trying to have a lot of small enterprises get launched, uh, assisting uh, enterprises that are already going, and then leveraging uh, big business here to work with them to get things to scale quickly. So now we have some of that background out of the way, I'll talk about this project. This project was under the, the Scale-Ups R&D program, and the, the original title was Improving Livelihoods in Morocco Through Microfinance. I want to you know, set the stage of where this project came from. Um, a microfinance institution came to D-Lab and said, we do microfinance in Middle East, North Africa, and we want to find appropriate technology that we can bring to our clients to improve their livelihoods. We deal uh, with the organization that's, that funded us for this project doesn't deal directly with customers. They support local microfinance institutions throughout the region. They said, we don't know anything about these type of products are the organizations we work with mainly work on financial products. So, can you guys come and do a needs assessment in order to identify what what type of appropriate technologies for specific regions um, uh, will be useful? So, we started off in Morocco. Uh, there's a very strong microfinance presence there, and at the time in 2012, when this started, it was around the Arab Spring, so it was a place that was uh, easier for MIT to do travel. So let's talk a little about the process of how we uh, approach this. Starting off with this pretty blank canvas of we have the target population of microfinance customers, and we know that we we kept open to designing new products. We we we'd rather focus on existing products in order to move things more rapidly. Uh, often there's a lot of times I feel that people look at a problem and say, oh, I'll, I'll design a solution for that. But oftentimes. Uh, stepping back and looking for existing products to meet that need that's been identified can be a quicker way to reach scale and reach impact. 
So we started off with a general needs assessment, and then from what was identified there, we narrowed it down by uh, doing a market analysis based on some of the information gathered uh, during this needs assessment and technology analysis, looking at taking this step back and say what technology is already out there. We moved on to a technology evaluation. This is what I'll talk most about what we did past summer. And the steps coming up, the next step is the distribution and market test. We go all the way from identifying the needs, picking some technologies that might be suitable, seeing if they are suitable, and then working on getting them into people's hands uh, and, and getting this operational as a sustainable business uh, operation for a, a company. Not starting a new company, but working with our big corporate partners. So this is in a slightly different format here, the same kind of thing, just to show you about the, I show this to show how we, we have a, uh, start off with a white canvas, have a bunch of ideas that come out, and then uh, these are all needs that are identified, and either because of the market or because we didn't have technologies that we could readily identify, some of these were blocked out. These two were chosen to go forward to the next stage. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the agriculture product, I didn't work on it primarily. But the, the, the basic idea here is there was an identification of need that cows weren't getting enough nutrition. And D-Lab then went into the field to do a technology evaluation on specific uh, ways to create, uh, it's called silage, where uh, feed was taken and stored and fermented to increase its nutritional content. And then that, project ended, uh, that, that arm of the project ended up stopping, not because of technical feasibility, but because they actually identified a partner in the same region who was doing the same thing. And so the conclusion was to connect farmers in the south to these large corporations in the north that were doing the exact same thing. And just by making that connection, we're looking to facilitate uh, bringing that technology to larger regions in the country. So, but I'll, I'll stick to the solar lighting, which will be the focus of what I'll talk about the rest of the day. Um, so first, I'll briefly talk about the market technology analysis, and we'll move on to the rest. So. The need was identified that there's uh, people need, need lighting. Even though Morocco has 97% electrification, there's still a one, uh, one million people without electricity. So this is not your most obvious market for solar lanterns. Uh, the places where these type of products are, uh, are most successful right now are places like India and Sub-Saharan Africa, where your regional electrification rates are well below 50%. So it's a non, and this is what, one thing I really like about this project is that it's, it's a non-obvious market. And if we identify a non-obvious market, it A, provides people access to products that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise because these manufacturers and distributors aren't looking to this place as the obvious place to go. And B, we open up more markets for the manufacturer, which, which the ones we work with are social businesses trying to advance social mission. So uh, we're allowing them to grow, to grow larger and support their efforts globally. Uh, so looking here, we have uh, non-electrified, there's over 200,000 uh, homes, this is now homes. Uh, 50,000 have no access to the grid, as in they can't, even if they wanted to, they couldn't get a grid connection. Uh, they're too far from the nearest post. These other 20,000 have what's called access to the grid, and this is kind of a, a trick that, um, I don't want to say a trick, but the government lists as people having access to the grid, even if they don't have uh, a, a plug in their house, which I feel like there's some linguistic um, gymnastics here uh, that, that needs to be clarified. So uh, they don't have a plug in their house, they, they could pay for it if they had the money to pay for it. Um, as well as, uh, and then, then there's the on-grid population still needs off-grid lighting, uh, still needs outdoor lighting solutions. So there's, people have electricity in their homes, but they don't have lighting outside. There's very little municipal lighting in rural Morocco. So we also identified uh, those populations as people who are using uh, products that, that these could be better than. Um, on a note, I think it's remarkable what the Moroccan government did since 1996. 12% electrification. Now they're up here at 97, 98% electrification in a very short time. So it's really phenomenal how, uh, how quickly they were able to electrify the country. A large part was through grid extension, and they also had uh, a program for small solar home systems. And so when we said, when we looked at this group that was, had not received electricity yet, we said, okay, well, how, how did this really successful program not reach these people? And so we looked at what are the, uh, well, we know they, if they didn't get on the grid, they didn't get on the grid because they couldn't afford it, or, or they, it was just too far to have any access to. So what, what are the other possible off-grid solutions? You go from mini-grids, and the solar home systems and solar lanterns. 
Mini grids require a certain population density typically to make it worth the, worth the cost of this type of infrastructure. So in these most remote areas, um, this was really not, this doesn't fall in the gap of what would be suitable in Morocco. And these small solar home systems were what uh, this program here was, was selling. And the issue there was they, they had some success, but uh, they financed them over 10 years, so they weren't asking people to do all up front. But the systems weren't large enough. People couldn't afford systems large enough to meet their needs. So when people were buying these systems, they were expecting to run a refrigerator, TV, et cetera, and the systems that people could afford, even finance over 10 years, weren't quite, wasn't quite fitting that gap, so it was a bit of a mismatch. And so what we identified then is, okay, what about this space way down here? It's, uh, you know, there's the sustainable energy access for all, there's these five tiers of energy access, and I don't have them exactly laid out like this, but this would be going from tier zero to tier one on electricity access, so it's the first step. Um, but what we feel like is, is that while Morocco's done a great job of getting people, a majority of the population, to tier three, four, and five, there's this area left behind that could go from zero to one, and that's what our initiative is uh, focusing on. So that's a little bit, I just use jargon on these different tiers. So I'll stop now and ask if there's any questions, because I just use a bunch of jargon. I was looking at you, and I know you know that one. <laughs> yeah? So you said this is, um, the microgrid is um, $5,000. Um, this is, so these numbers here, this is like a per household cost of how much it would take for annually, uh, I believe that that's what I'm looking at right here, it's annually per household. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's a system cost, and you can have a mini grid as small as 5,000, sorry. Right yeah, so is that Morocco specific? No, this is not Morocco specific, but this, remember this mini grid system goes way up, it's a matter of how much capacity do you want here, this is somewhat of a logarithmic, this is a logarithmic scale here, so you're looking at mini grids can go way up, depends on the capacity. Yeah? How reliable is the grid in Morocco? Do people who have access yeah. to the grid have good access? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so we, um, I'll, I'll touch on that later. I don't know how much data I show here, but we did ask about that for the, uh, the on-grid, and then we also have this category that comes up called, we call it semi-connected which just uh, came out of when, when we were in the field, classified, we went to classify everything in A and B categories so we could do the first. This is one group of people that just didn't quite fit in. Uh, so some people had, the two ways people would fall in the semi-category is if A, they had unreliable access, or if they were, what do you call it, illegally or doing something non-structured uh, with having a wire going to their neighbor's house and having a lower amount of, uh, of the draw that they could pull, so they, weren't, they didn't have this kind of full electrification. But in general, the people that were connected were, were, had very good reliability, nothing like the India situation, if that's what we were getting at. Yeah. Yeah? When you were doing market research, did you find anything that was startly, like, startlingly surprising from, like, the paper research? Or was it pretty um, consistent? Um, so this is a funny question because I started working at D-Lab as things were right underway, <laughs> so I was doing both at the same time. I was getting accustomed with the background research about at the same time uh, as I was getting data from the field. Okay. So it's hard for me to answer that uh, surprise question. Um, I found all, I, I mean the thing that surprised me the most, just stepping way back, is that how quickly Morocco electrified the amount they did. That's the one thing. I, it just gives me a lot of hope to see that, I mean, with, with the, a certain amount of resources and, and effort in a country, you know, 33 million people can electrify that quickly. I'd say that's the biggest thing to jump at. These people who are off grid and can't really afford much beyond the solar lanterns, are they primarily agricultural? Like, is that their primary occupation? Yeah, or? that's, it's one of the dominant, but it's not ex exclusive. But it is mostly agrarian rural. Yeah. Uh -huh. Excuse me. Yeah? Sorry? For the mini grids to be viable, you need a certain population density. Yeah. So, do you have any numbers on what the threshold is? Um, so, people yeah. on the other end of, uh, over in this building, I know I've seen Robert Stoner talk about, Robert, is that right? Yeah. Robert Stoner. He's talked about that. So, this, I work, the, this building has all that information. Um, I can try to, I'm sure we can pass along resources if you're interested in those specific numbers. So, I've seen, uh, the head of the MIT Energy Initiative did that. Uh, for, I think it's on the order of like 20 homes. 
within a certain region is like where you would stop thinking about, you, you wouldn't, if you own like five homes, you would just do individual systems. If you get towards 20 and 50 homes with a certain draw, that's where you'd start to move up. That's so it's a function of a, like a few different factors, demand, the distance of the homes from each other, yeah. and their distance from the grid. And they're affordable. So within this bottom left category, um, DLab so, and DLab's partner was aware, DLab's partner cite the comprehensive initiative and technology evaluation that uh, kind of sits between DLab and uh, the Department of Urban Studies. Had been doing a, a, value, a technical evaluation on solar lanterns uh, specific to the context of Uganda. So we had a bunch of these lanterns lying around. We were aware of their general features. And by we, I mean the team before I joined. Um, and did a focus group on these lanterns. And uh, of these products, in order to narrow the field, uh, people in Morocco definitely felt like only the brighter lights were sufficient. And they also really, really valued mobile charging. Uh, one reason why uh, some of the existing lighting sources they had are gas lamps. And these are fairly bright. So often, uh, the value proposition of these solar lanterns are going up against is kerosene. And so some of these smaller units are comparable or, or better than kerosene. But in Morocco, kerosene is not prevalent. It's these natural gas. It's a gas canister with a mantle that lights up. And it's pretty bright. So people aren't going to want to take a step down in brightness. So there's just kind of a minimum threshold that was identified. And through that, we identified this product as well as another product that wasn't an initial focus group, but in the same product class. So those were selected to go forward to the next phase of this technology evaluation. So within solar lighting, we've now eliminated these, moved over here. This was all done in technology evaluation. I'm not going to talk about this. So then within here, we're looking at urban and rural solar lighting. The rural was the, what I've been talking about mostly. And the urban solar lighting um, uh, potential market that they identified <coughs> were these ambulant merchants, these mobile merchants in, in, in urban areas where there's not necessarily enough street lighting. They're using gas lamps. And we said, OK, well, if people are wanting to replace solar lanterns for gas lamps in the rural areas, how about the urban areas to give people mobile lighting solutions? So we investigated that as well. So now let's talk about this technology evaluation phase. <coughs> so the sample composition, this is one uh, province within Morocco. We had uh, five douars, which is like a small community uh, within that region with uh, uh, these number of households that each were given a light. These are the two models we gave out, 50% uh, 50, uh, 50 of each. And we also had these different uh, souks. Souks are these weekly markets in the urban areas. <coughs> uh, these different souks got these lights. This is just to give you a rough idea of the sample composition. Um, the upcoming slides have a lot of data. I wanted to show you more. I'm, I'm prefacing the like, you should not show the slides that are for a different context. Um, I want to show you the type of work we did and not drill down on the actual numbers. Um, but feel free to ask questions uh, if you want. So the type of thing we looked at was, what do people currently use? So how many hours a day do people use lights? And how much money do they spend on them? So we had our different segments. We broke into rural down into our off-grid, our semi-connected, and our on-grid, and the merchants as well. And so the bars here are, some people have electricity, obviously the off-grid has no electricity, gas lamps, flashlights, and candles. Um, and we get an amount of, uh, for these different categories, how much time and how much money they spend on them. The money they spend on, spend on them ends up being very critical, uh, particularly in the later stages when we try to see, are these things actually affordable, and how are we going to uh, distribute them? <coughs> So other things we looked at in the survey, we did uh, open-ended questions. Just uh, This is kind of a summary of, of a couple questions of what do you think of these lights? And there's things that people spoke, these are in their own words translated, but in their own words not circling from a, uh, uh, it's not, not a survey where you feel it has an open-ended question. So things like that it's very useful for charging phones, which obviously isn't uh, possible with their existing uh, lighting sources, that it's economic, this, um, and good overall quality uh, of the product and good, good quality of light. So the economic one uh, was interesting because something we did in this study that has benefits and drawbacks is we didn't tell people how much the light costs. So it was very uh, interesting that people said, oh, it's a good value. 
because they think it's a good value because the they know it's solar and they don't have to charge it. So it's a good value. Of course, it's a good value for free. Um, and the question is, how much is it going to cost? And so we'll we'll deal with this uh, the price point. I'll, I'll get to that later. Um, but so these are the kind of questions we ask. This was a instead of an open-ended uh, question, this was a direct comparison. Earlier, uh, this is now after the, so sorry, I need to say that uh, we gave people these lights for a month. They had them for four weeks, and they used them for four weeks comparing against their debate. So some of these uh, questions were asked at the baseline, and some were asked afterwards. So the questions of how much you spend, so those were all baselines. And we asked, also asked people what the things you care most about in the light. So from those baseline questions, in the month while people had the lights, we developed the follow-up survey, which involved these open-ended questions, and then these questions of, okay, we know these are your four categories. These are the um, five areas that you said are most important. Now, now that you've had this light for a month, how do you compare? And this is kind of an aggregated of uh, you know, condensing this all down. So people with electricity uh, said that it wasn't as bright and, and wasn't, didn't cover as much area, which um, is correct. Uh, <laughs> So not very subjective there. Um, so it's very objective. So nice to, you know, we actually had light meters uh, that we took, that we had to go from the to the field take to measure uh, the amount of light just to see what's going on. And this particularly came up with the merchants. Uh, we found that these light me uh, light measurements gave us some insights into why people did or didn't like the lights. Um, but they were better than flashlights in all categories, better than candles. And this area covered the same or better. So these lamps are about as uh, similar brightness and, and, and spread to the gas lamps. Um, now, this is for the rural households. Now, for the merchants, they're not using candles or flashlights. They're only using the only existing lighting sources for electricity or gas. So with the electricity, you notice the same, uh, both brightness and area covered are the same. But here, the merchants, surprisingly, you look at this, you say, okay, well, why, are, why do they like it worse? It's the same thing. Well, it's not the same thing. They have different types of lamps in the urban areas. So they have brighter lamps. Uh, and so by, when we started to see this data come in, we actually sent a light meter over to Morocco real quick and said, all right, let's get a, get a picture of what's going on here to kind of uh, get that quantitatively captured to understand uh, why. So we found that they were brighter lamps and that there was just more ambient light in the area. So these lights weren't making as big of a dent. And so due to these areas uh, and some market analysis, we ended up not pursuing the merchant uh, direction and focusing on the rural. Another one was is that we didn't want to give a product uh, that, was become, that would potentially become obsolete. The Ministry of Industry is considering, part of the, we were engaging with them, because they were considering looking to formalize this merchant sector. These uh, street vendors were previously considered uh, this kind of, uh, transitional profession that wasn't really a profession, but the ministry actually did a big survey of the merchants and found that like 10% of the population in, in, is a full-time merchant, and the average time pe people have been merchants is like 15 years, it's their regular job, they make better than median income. So all this really interesting stuff about merchants, so the government got really interested in thinking, well, how can we, this is such a big part of the economy, how can we support this? Um, so we were engaged with that, but then basically our recommendation is, is we definitely shouldn't move forward with anything without engaging with them because they're considering doing something and, and really looking at the lighting needs of the merchants. Something uh, brighter than these lights would be more suitable uh, for the long term. I mean, I think these could provide some benefit in the short term, but we don't want to like start launching a business for something that would have a better alternative or to uh, they could become obsolete if the if the if the city decided to bring the merchants into. Uh, uh, one specific market area and then light that area. So we wanted, we, we're not trying to like push this product down anybody's throat. So on the lab testing side, we did some work back in the lab. Um, there were all these flashlights, these electric electric flashlights all here, that were available on the market. And so when we, all the time before that I said flashlight, um, we're doing a 730, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, these are the actual products. We had these products, they shipped back, and I spent this summer playing with these flashlights and testing uh, these, these lighting spread, how, how bright is the light, if you can measure the brightness direct, if you hold it above, how does it light an area, if you set it in a room, how does it illuminate all around the room, we call this ambient lighting. So we have these three different lighting tests, I'm not going to dig into the data here, but the real key is, is that the main factors that go into here are how good is the battery, 
The batteries in these products last 10 times as long as a, a lead acid battery, which are in these flashlights. What's the price? How well does it light for a given task? And then this value metric that I made up, um, but I think is really uh, indicative. Um, and saying that the, the, the one product gives more light uh, over the lifetime of the product per dollar. Oh, and also how long does it last for? It's like this will stay on for six hours, and these lights go off after about two hours. They just don't. So there's some kind of backing up the, um, the product value with, with quantitative things against the most direct competitor of the, the flashlight that's available on the market. Another analysis tool we use um, which is what's called a conjoint analysis. I just want to briefly mention this just to talk about the kind of, we're always looking for new techniques to uh, do needs assessment and market analysis. So this is a, a, a technique where you have two different give the user two different questions. And you say, would you want a light that is 150 uh, dirhams, this is like uh, $20, that's this bright and runs this long, or would you rather a light that's $40, this bright and runs for six hours? And, and this A, B question, and then people get 10 of these questions and then answer, and then there's a regression analysis that's done that tells um, what the most important preference is. So you have like 20 people answer 10 of these questions and they're generated in a way to use regression analysis. So the outcome of this was basically that price was actually the least uh, important factor and that brightness was the most important factor in people's decisions. Now, of course, there's no money changing hands here, so this has to be taken with, uh, um, within those limitations so it's not an actual purchase decision that's being made. But it's a way to rapidly assess and get these kind of uh, these preferences. And it was interesting. Some of the some of the people actually didn't finish the survey because they, after two or three questions, would just say, "I will always choose brightness," or "I will always choose the lowest price product." And we just rolled those down. And that was uh, having that explicit response. Then actually just say that instead of just going, you know, choosing the one all the time was uh, was it was interesting. So purchase intent. People, these, this percentage of people, so over 50%, uh, the merchants uh, uh, were, were leaving that aside for other reasons, but over 50%, you know, of course, the 80%, especially for the off-grid and semi-connected, I'm simply willing to purchase it. We didn't tell them what they cost, and we didn't tell them anything about warranty or expected lifetime of the product, and these are the numbers they came up with. So the price, I not have expected Okay, so the, the price is actually, this is in, in Durham, so these numbers are in the order of uh, $25 and the light sells for $40. So we're significantly under um, uh, you know, $25 here, this is down here more like uh, in the low teens, 10 to $15, and they're selling for $40. So we're, we're below the price, but we haven't told people, it's kind of a thing we, we could have, should have asked. Uh, we had time to do the analysis of, of, of give them a value proposition. Um, and so, looking back, one thing we should have done is ask this question first and then follow up with, well, here's a payment structure we could offer you this light on. And would you do it that way? Would you pay $40 cash? Or would you pay $4 for 10 weeks? Or we should have, we should have come in with that. So that's a lesson learned that we had to, uh, to basically ask this question directly uh, instead of leaving the open-ended question. Um, so. From the evaluation, we recommended this product over the other uh, two products that are quite similar, both in the lab testing and the relative comparison between this light and the other light, uh, the users preferred this one. We didn't give anybody head-to-head -head comparisons. It was the, all, almost all the factors, this light came up uh, better in comparison to gas, in comparison to flashlights than the other light. So we uh, focused on one product here. And so the idea, we said it's both for the replacement of Gas lamps, candles, flashlights in the home for people who are off with have no light in the home. But something that was surprising is that there was a significant need for people who are on grid for their outdoor activities, between flashlights and candles, for, for, for walking outside, for uh, the, the specific things that people said were for checking on animals, uh, for going to visit neighbors, and for going to the bathroom. Uh, so that was pretty important, actually, in our decision to go forward because the market size and, and the distribution of off-grid houses is, is fairly low. So the ability for there to be demand from these on-grid homes, it's real demand, they actually want the product, they're going to pay for it, uh, makes the 
possibility of making this a business uh, much more viable because you can reach larger scale, you have a given agent in a given region being able to sell more lights. So this is the direction we're going in. Um, so this is the idea, we have this persona, this idea of creating a persona. Here's our target customer. He's, he has a family of five, he's a, uh, he's a farmer, he, he breeds cattle. Um, he, can't, he, he has access to the grid, but it would cost him a ton of money. Uh, that's like $10,000 at least. And he currently uses a mixture of gas, candles, and flashlights in his home. Here's his expenditures. He spends uh, about $10 a month on his existing lighting sources. And so what's the value proposition to him? We also found we can't say that this light would replace all of his existing lighting expenditures because people uh, have more than one light in their home. So we asked people about their replacement when they had this light. Did you stop using your other lighting sources? Uh, some people said they liked it better and they said they didn't, but they didn't replace the other lighting sources. And we had to kind of drill down on that and say, what do you mean you didn't replace? Oh, we replaced some but not all. So it's this question of when you say replace, is it everything or one? So what we, what we came up with is we think that one of these lights would replace about half of people's uh, How much lighting. How uh, Yeah. Um, I don't have that here off the top of my head, but it's, it's at least 10 times that household expenditure. It, it's, it's less than 10%. Uh, so it's more than... Yeah, it's more than $100 a month. It's more than $100 a month. Sorry, I don't have that, that kind of resolution. But it's not $2 a day or anything like that. Um, it's around 10 times. So, so the expenditure is going to be... It's about 10% 10, 10 or less, yeah, the total. So we actually did this um, uh, progress out of poverty index. It's this, because uh, in some cultures it's, it's difficult to ask directly how much money do you make. And the Grameen Foundation has this indicator called the uh, Progress Out of Poverty Index. And what they've done is they've gotten this information and then asked people a ton of, ton of questions about their lives. And for each different country, they do a regression analysis. You ask, how many rooms do you have? How many kids do you have? What uh, grade education do you have? And for each country, it's different. Something like, do you have a cell phone? Is, is highly correlated to income? And so we, can, we ask this question to get a measure of the... Uh, the, the income. And I think I should have that in the appendix. We can, I can answer that question later. Um, yeah. Are there any other questions? So, what we want to do here is just say, okay, this light will replace half of your lighting needs. This is how much it costs. This is how much you'll save a month. Half of your uh, 90 dirham uh, expenditure. So, this will pay for itself in eight and a half months. We finance it over a year, which is a, a typical loan term. Um, then it'll pay back for that, and then over the life cycle of the product, so this is saying that the product has a five-year lifetime. It comes with a two-year warranty, and this company is very good with their warranties. It's a pretty much uh, anything warranty. They'll even replace if a uh, cable is chewed through by a, a mouse or a rat or whatnot. Um, we talked to people who sell these uh, these lights in other markets, and they, they validate that these guys do honor their warranty. And one guy said, of 100 I've sent back, they, they didn't consider one under warranty because it literally had tire tracks on it and they said no, that's a little much. Um, so so you're talking about our partners, uh, working with the right partners for D-Lab is very important and I'll, I'll touch on that uh, in a minute here. So this is kind of the value proposition we're looking at. If someone were to buy two of these, we're saying they could replace all of their lighting uses, uh, the, the, their existing lighting sources and um, you know, it would be twice the price but the same payback ratios. One reason why people weren't, sometimes people, one person would want to go outside and the other person would want to be inside, so obviously you only have one light and there's typically five members in the household. So, taking a step back, saying where were we, where are we going? We started off with this blank canvas. We said here's all of these different possibilities for the needs assessment. From the market and technology analysis, we said we eliminated these three, uh, the brown ones. We said, okay, well, we'll move forward, think about these areas from the technology evaluation, we eliminated the nutrition for cattle because it wasn't needed. The urban, they, they didn't uh, have the need for these products. They didn't quite fit in. We said there's a market in the rural. Okay, how are we going to test this on a real market? So we, we identified three different, uh, we identified uh, a number of different distribution strategies that are used for these same products in other markets. We said, what can we learn from those lessons 
and apply them to the uh, context of Morocco. <coughs> so, the, any questions at this point? Um, so, the typical way to retail things is through a, the, uh, uh, a network of retail stores. So you have, um, this is just having an importer come in to a middleman to a typical store. This has a low operational cost because these things are already existing, um, but a low market penetration because we're talking about these, these last mile populations, these very remote populations that don't have, they can't get to the store as easily as, uh, as people in urban areas. So we say low market penetration, but low operational cost because you're not talking about a lot of uh, additional uh, sales personnel doing things they wouldn't do otherwise. Your product's sitting on a shelf and you market it as you would um, the, the marketing is a variable that we uh, cross-cut all of these, so it's not anything, anything additional. Another approach that's, that's been very successful in getting deep market penetration is this idea of having a direct-to-customer sales network. This is where your manufacturer or some uh, local entity has a network of people who exclusively sell these lanterns in their communities. Uh, you need a high population density for this to work. If you have somebody walk, bike, motorcycle, drive around. It's going to cost a lot of money if you have to drive 10 miles between houses to try and sell this little product, uh, and little inexpensive products. It's going to take a lot of uh, you know, fuel costs, the cost of people's time. So that one, because it's operational cost, and particularly because the rural population density in Morocco is not that high, we ruled that one out. And this is in direct contrast to somewhere like India or Bangladesh. There's, uh, there's lots of lessons from solar lighting in India and Bangladesh, I think with um, you know, with mini grids and solar home systems in Bangladesh particularly, um, and it's amazing what they're doing there. Unfortunately, those lessons aren't applicable to everyone in the world because a fundamental thing uh, in a lot of those models is having sales agents that live in a community and can serve a certain base of customers. So we, we ruled out that one because this operational cost was too high for this type of market. The other was a franchisee, which is where you have someone who, this may not be their entire livelihood, but they're already engaging in sales activities, and uh, they would then act as an agent of this company and sell this uh, as, a, as a branded product. Be, the key here is that they're trained in the sales and after-sales service to honor the warranty, be able to tell people the value proposition of the light, be able to tell them the features, something that typically wouldn't happen as much in a retail store where you have a whole shelf full of products. Um, so this has a higher operational cost, but, but a better market penetration because you're having these people going out from the retail place or from wherever their home base is, going more towards people's stores, and the entrepreneur decides how, how aggressively to push. The fourth is this idea of an institutional partnership. This could be with an NGO, uh, it could be with uh, a company doing a corporate social responsibility initiative uh, that would be selling to, say, their employees. In our case, we're working with a microfinance uh, institution. So way, way back in the beginning, I said we were, we were working with a, uh, an organization that funds microfinance institutions. And so we are working with one of their partners, and they said, okay, well, we'll we will go and sell to people and get them to buy loans uh, to then buy the product with. So we'll, we'll, they'll, they'll agree for a loan and then buy this product. So they have their agents going into rural areas already. So that gives us a better market penetration. There's still additional cost because these sales agents are not doing things they wouldn't be doing otherwise. So the retail approach, we have our manufacturer going to the distributor, and the distributor sells to the end user. Pretty straightforward. The reason why I do this is because the next one is not quite as straightforward, where you have the manufacturer go to the distributor. Now, the microfinance institution is not allowed to sell third-party products. They can't take possession of them at all. So how do we make this work? We have the end user uh, agree to a loan. They get a voucher and they'll pay back the microfinance institution in installments. Then the end user has to travel to the distribution location, exchange the voucher for the lantern, and then the distributor exchanges the voucher for the full, for the full purchase price with the microfinance institution, who then is repaid in finance after this, the rest of this transaction is complete. Um, they didn't want more slides with more boxes. Uh, if you have the, if you go through the micro franchisee, you can have them sit in this box and then sell to the end user, or same in the retail box down there. There's too many arrows already. So, what are the key challenges for distribution? Um, the key things that we're worried about right now, one is, is, is stepping back here, especially in a model like this, 
having three good partners here is really important. The manufacturer is adamant about the honoring the warranty. Every actor along their sales chain underneath them, under their supply chain, uh, is held accountable to re return things back up the supply chain. They have a system where they don't wait for the product to get back to their offices. They say, tell me how many you're returning this month, and we'll add that to your order, and we'll sort that out later so we can get the return back to the customer as quick as possible. Um, they're gonna, they, they'll send agents to Morocco, to the country, or wherever they work, to train the people that are doing any sales activities, sales and marketing activities. Uh, the distributor, so Tal is this large oil and gas company. They have a corporate social responsibility initiative in many other countries. Uh, they haven't identified Morocco as a market, um, somewhat for obvious reasons, because it's not the most obvious market to go to. But we brought this to them and showed them the data we collected and said this opportunity. They said, okay, we'll participate and try to ex expand our corporate social responsibility initiative. And the microfinance partner, this is what th they kind of initiated the whole thing of wanting to try to serve their customers and it's not going to be a huge financial gain for them, but in the long run, it's going to make them be able to more fully serve their customers and, and be able to uh, uh, have a competitive advantage over the other MFIs or just to improve their, their mission. Did you have a question about that? Oh, sorry. Um, and then similarly, if we are going to do a, a micro-franchisee model, uh, we have to have someone to coordinate those micro-franchisees, and that's something we're, we're working on. So... The keys are we have to train all the actors along the distribution network. With a microfinance model, there's this difficult product transfer coordination to the end user. We're going to, um, these manufacturers have used this model in other markets. We'll see how it goes. This is why we're doing a market test. Um, we have hopes and doubts on, on the ability for this to work. Uh, we're we're going to overlay a map of what agencies are where for the microfinance decision, where there's retail outlets that these can be, that this transfer can happen. And with the micro entrepreneur model, we're working with people who, uh, there, there's a, two foundations that work with groups of young entrepreneurs and existing entrepreneurs uh, that sell these solar, uh, that, that sell, do other things outside of solar lights that they could potentially do these as, as add on businesses. And then pricing, there's this issue of coordinating pricing. If you have all these multiple sales channels, there's worry about visibility of, oh, I can get it cheaper there, but it's too far, so I won't buy it at all, and, and coordinating the price in there is a, um, something that needs to be considered, and, and it's a multi-stakeholder conversation. So, that's most of what I have. We have our timeline here. I won't walk you through that since we've got uh, 10 minutes left, and I want lots of questions. Thanks.